Kevin Garnett is the greatest player in the history of the Minnesota Timberwolves. No one else comes close to the former MVP. Garnett went on to win a title with the Celtics, who later retired his jersey. He was an obvious choice for Hall of Fame enshrinement. But even five years after Garnett stopped playing, the team with which he spent most of his career had not joined in honoring him by raising his number 21 to the rafters. Why not? Because of beef. Being an NBA superstar has its benefits. You get paid many millions of dollars, fans cheer for you, and the pregame food spreads are exquisite. But it also tends to mean letting some billionaire franchise owner get way, way richer off your labor than you ever will. Let's talk about this billionaire. Glenn Taylor was born and raised in Minnesota. He stuck around to build his printing business and become the state's richest individual. He also served as a Republican state senator during the 1980s. Taylor left public office in 1990, but remains an active Republican donor, contributing to campaigns like that of former Iowa Congress goblin Steve King. So yeah, very much the kind of guy who owns a sports franchise. In 94-95, Taylor spent around $90 million of that tasty paper money to purchase majority ownership of his hometown NBA team, which was already in rough shape after just five years of existence. Taylor quickly assembled the important faces of a new Timberwolves generation. He hired executive Kevin McHale, who in turn hired a fellow Golden Gopher, Flip Saunders, as coach, then drafted a fellow Kevin, Garnett, in 1995. Garnett represented a bit of novelty for his era, a lottery pick straight out of high school. He more than satisfied the hype. Garnett could uncork volcanic dunks, flick you to death from mid-range, and defend just about anyone. The target center crowd seemed to feed his howling, prowling game. And that relationship to the fan base extended off the court, where he was a generous and engaged part of the Minneapolis community. After two years of rapid development, Garnett signed what was, at the time, the largest contract in NBA history. The 21-year-old extended his commitment to the Wolves for $121 million over six years. That was an unprecedented amount of money for any NBA player, let alone a 21-year-old. But it's not like Taylor did that out of the goodness of his heart. Garnett rejected Minnesota's initial extension offer and forced Taylor's hand. He knew a budding superstar could find some other billionaire to pay him the record-setting money he was worth. And then NBA owners worked very hard to lengthen rookie commitments and cap star salary to prevent others from getting paid like KG. Anyway, Garnett remained a Timberwolf for 10 more years. The organization failed him for almost that whole time. Their owner was a big part of that. Some franchisees only show up to write the checks. Glenn Taylor has never been that kind. He was always present, in the arena, in negotiations, in press conferences, and in the extremely dumb scandal that kneecapped the team's ability to build around Garnett. The Wolves lost four first-round draft picks during KG's prime. That's because in 2000, Taylor and Kevin McHale got caught trying to be slick, tendering an illegal under-the-table contract for free agent Joe Smith, who wasn't even particularly good. As a penalty for what he called fraud of shocking magnitude, Commissioner David Stern suspended Taylor and McHale and stripped all those precious draft picks. That hurt because the Wolves had used KG's big contract as cover to let their initial base of supporting talent dissolve. Tom Gugliotta broke out in 97, then signed with Phoenix in 98. Stefan Marbury played his best years elsewhere, and so did Chauncey Billups. The Wolves' pursuit of new co-stars hardly registered. Wally Zerbiak was Garnett's most consistent, productive teammate in Minnesota. He made one all-star team, which is the same number of times Garnett tried to kick his ass in practice. Sam Cassell starred at point guard in 2004, the only season the Wolves enjoyed any playoff success. Then, Minnesota alienated Cassell and lost him in a horrendous trade. Garnett's substantial salary, his opinions, and perhaps his… passion did complicate Wolves' business, 
At times, KG's favorite teammates had leverage over management simply because he liked them. But Garnett liking someone only went so far. Flip Saunders coached Garnett from the star's teenage years until he was 28, a rare long-term pairing that made the two extremely close. But in February 2005, Taylor commanded McHale to do something about the Wolves' losing record, which McHale took as initiative to fire his friend Flip and make himself head coach. While the move seemed to help in the short term, Garnett's Wolves never made another postseason. Garnett had every reason to want out, but the 2007 trade that sent him to Boston supposedly wasn't his idea. Garnett was actually upset to see his name in rumors. At the time Garnett's Wolves career ended, you'd find scant evidence that the star had any problem with Taylor or vice versa. Even right after the breakup, Taylor went out of his way to dispute rumors that Garnett had forced a trade, and the closest Garnett got to speaking ill of his old employer was a vague comment about loyalty. But with those years, that waste of Garnett's prime as preamble, here comes the beef. Garnett's first season with the Celtics became a historic success. Boston won 66 games and the 2008 championship. The 07-08 Wolves won 22 games. By March of 08, Taylor was grumpy enough to chuck a few darts. He suggested that Garnett tanked it at the end of the 06-07 season. KG was unbelievably durable throughout his Wolves tenure, but that tenure ended with five missed games because of injury. Most people assumed the Wolves shelved Garnett to improve their lottery odds. But no, Taylor went on record insisting Garnett's teammates had wanted to keep playing for wins and Garnett did not. From Boston, Garnett brushed aside the comments. Garnett's agent echoed the general response to such claims. Kevin Garnett is borderline sociopathic about winning, the last person you'd expect to quit on his team. Ridiculous accusation. KG did not hold this against his old teammates or their fan base. He actually dedicated that Celtics championship to Minnesota. But his love for the place and its people did not extend to the organization. During one return visit with the Celtics in 2012, Garnett's usual warm words for the city included a shot at the franchise so casual you could have missed it. I have nothing positive to say, so I'm just to be that. When a Minnesota fan begged Garnett to return, Garnett responded, no way. Things changed, though. Motivated by some big recent sales, Glenn Taylor expressed interest in selling a minority stake in the Timberwolves. The expectation was that the new part owner would eventually buy out Taylor's share. And something else changed. Flip Saunders had already returned to the Wolves as team president. After trading Kevin Love for a new young core, Saunders became head coach as well. In November 2014, the 38-year-old Garnett was playing out his twilight for the Brooklyn Nets, but got asked about the shifting landscape in Minnesota. Garnett said bluntly that he wanted to take Taylor's offer and someday buy the team. That would cost a lot more than it cost Taylor in 94. In the meantime, Minnesota assembled a February 2015 trade for KG, who waived the no-trade clause in his contract to reunite with the coach who helped guide him from teen star to MVP. It was, of course, also a reunion with the franchise owner who traded him in 07, then singled him out with tanking accusations. The guy who'd said paying KG's favorite teammates drove him nuts. Garnett spoke of forgiving and forgetting when it came to Taylor. Well, okay, maybe not forgetting, but he wanted to make the relationship work. After all, his ultimate post-playing goal was to do a huge business deal with the guy. Saunders' position as mediator was crucial to repairing the bridge that would lead Garnett to his fairy tale ending. In fact, the grand plan was for Saunders to join KG in buying stake in the franchise. Encouraged by his coach, Garnett envisioned himself not only investing, but making decisions, building the championship team the franchise never built for him. In the meantime, KG and Flip would ride it out as player and coach. Garnett signed a two-year extension in mid-2015. It'd be like the old times, except now the kid was nearing 40. But before 2015 training camp, tragedy struck. In August, Saunders announced he had been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. His health deteriorated quickly, and on October 25, 2015, a husband, father of four, and beloved icon of Minnesota basketball died at age 60. 
Saunders' sudden illness and passing broke hearts all around the state. It devastated the Wolves organization. The Wolves held a memorial for Saunders before their home opener in November. They put a tribute video on the Jumbotron and played the rest of the season with Flip's name on their chest. And the timing of this tragedy had a ripple effect. Saunders had been key to the Garnett Taylor detente. It was Flip who persuaded Garnett to accept the trade back to Minnesota, and it was Flip who engaged Garnett about seeking an active ownership role. After Saunders' passing, those notions seemed to vanish. Whatever understanding Garnett had with his coach was lost on the owner. At the end of that difficult 15-16 season, Glenn Taylor wiped out the front office and dismissed interim coach Sam Mitchell, a friend and former teammate of Garnett's. Garnett had spent the whole season excited about running the Wolves someday, and here came some job openings, at least some opportunities for input. But no, Taylor went ahead and filled those seats on his own, with outside hires, GM Scott Layden and coach president Tom Thibodeau. The outgoing coach, Mitchell, suggested his friend would not appreciate this sudden swerve. And indeed, a couple months later, Garnett requested the Wolves buy out the last year on his contract. Reports describe the negotiation as tense, though Garnett did collect his full salary for a season he didn't play ball anywhere, actually. KG announced his retirement days after the buyout in the form of a Minnesota-centric Instagram post that told fans to stay tuned. But Garnett spent his first season away from the court on TV, not in the Minnesota front office. His beef with Taylor began to reheat. In an interview with John Krasinski, whose reporting on this topic is second to none, Garnett criticized Taylor's organization for the way they memorialized Saunders. KG had chosen not to participate in that 2015 tribute video, explaining that he couldn't stuff a lifetime of friendship into his allotted three minutes. Garnett was upset the Wolves didn't raise a banner to commemorate Saunders and felt like the memorial was shoved down the throats of younger players who barely remembered Flip. Minnesota did eventually hang a banner for what it's worth. On that note, Taylor was talking around the same time about raising Garnett's jersey to the target center rafters. KG said he hadn't heard from the team about retiring his number. And while promoting his TV show, Garnett continued to entertain questions about the Wolves. He believed the Wolves changed course after Saunders' death. He called that outcome a huge disappointment that showed him the real Glenn Taylor. Garnett reminded everyone that while he was playing out his record-setting contract, Taylor's franchise value increased by way, way more than that. It multiplied. The superstar who generated so much of that value wanted it back. He wanted control. He wanted to cut straight to buying out Taylor. Forget that old plan of minority ownership. Meanwhile, Garnett's remaining connections within the team tried to restore relations. Carl Anthony Towns helped coax Garnett back to the Target Center for a game in 2018, the night they honored the late Prince. The team equipment manager made Garnett a special jersey, but on that note, KG didn't sound enthusiastic about retiring his number 21. And he still went out of his way to roast Taylor and company. He told Michael Pina Minnesota's front office sucked. And when Wolves star Jimmy Butler demanded a trade, Garnett broadcast sympathy for the guy who had to deal with his old boss. And he's dealing with Glenn, who, who doesn't know shit about basketball. Glenn. Garnett made the media rounds again in 2020, when his name came up for Hall of Fame induction and a Jersey retirement in Boston. Taylor issued public congratulations and sort of hinted at the glaring exception among those honors. Still no official tribute in the building Garnett played most of his career. Shams Tarania prodded Garnett about Jersey retirement, and Garnett unloaded. He said Taylor's motivations weren't genuine. He said Taylor went back on an understanding they had before Saunders died. And for all that, he called Taylor a snake. He'd never do business with his company. Snake, snake, snake. But then, Taylor told people he intended to sell the Wolves outright, for well over a billion dollars. Garnett's tone changed. He said he'd put together a bidding group and praised Taylor while doing so. But it sounds like Taylor preferred others. Despite limiting himself to buyers who'd keep the team in Minnesota, Taylor entered 2021 courting plenty of offers. Experienced NBA governors, local sports fixtures, and even former players, but not Garnett. 
Kevin Garnett's number should be retired in Minnesota, and it probably will be someday. Maybe by the time you watch this video. But that will probably require new Timberwolves ownership. If not Garnett himself, then at least someone other than Glenn Taylor. Because all the money these two men made each other rests on a bed of beef. And the one man capable of bringing these two together is gone far too soon. Rest in peace, Flip Saunders. Thank you so much for watching. We've got more episodes of Beef over here. And if you want a little more detail on how the Timberwolves fell apart, check out this episode of Collapse.